Uh, so it obviously starts in the eye, um, and the first part of the process is that the cornea, the transparent part of the very front of our eye and our lens, focuses an image onto the neural tissue that lines the inside of the back of the eye, which is called the retina. And it's, it's just like a, a, any sort of projection system. It, it projects that image onto this array of cells. And uh, we then need to have a way of translating that pattern of light exposure on the retina into a pattern of nerve impulses. And that's undertaken by very specialist cells called photoreceptors. And the photoreceptors have proteins that are light sensitive, so they absorb photons. And every time they absorb a photon, they change their conformation in a way that allows them to initiate a signaling cascade, which changes ultimately the physiology of those cells. So those photoreceptor cells change their physiology in such a way that they generate a, an electrophysiological signal which is transmitted then to neighboring cells and ultimately is passed down the optic nerve to the brain. And then the brain, in various complicated ways, takes that signal that comes from the retina and uses it to generate our perception of the visual world. There are also very, very predictable changes in the total amount of light and also actually in its spectral distribution across the 24-hour day. And throughout evolutionary history, organisms have measured that change in light intensity as a way of telling time. Because in the absence of a, of, a, of, a, of a wristwatch or something, how else do you know what time of day it is? So, uh, the retina plays a really important role in determining many aspects of physiology aside from allowing us to perceive the world around us. So the principal way that works is that um, signals from the eyes are detected by a part of the brain in the hypothalamus which is commonly understood as being a body clock, so this is called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. We have internal biological clocks which, uh, uh, which keep uh, time with a period of about 24 hours, and those clocks need to be reset to local time regularly. So if I were to fly to New York tonight, there's obviously a time difference, and I would suffer jet lag until my internal clock gets synchronized to local time in New York. And by far the most important way that my local clock knows that it, my internal clock knows that it's out of synchrony with local time is because it's expecting it to be dark when it's light. And so the, 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 that light signal is really important in setting our uh, biological clock. Um, and what that does is it plays a really important role in allowing humans and animals, and indeed um, almost all organisms have something similar. So what it allows them to do is predict changes in the environment and adjust aspects of their physiology to um, in, in line with the expected demands on them at that time of day. So of course, from a behavioral level, you can understand this as being really important because it allows animals to be active at times when food is available or to avoid predators, for example. At the physiological level, it allows them to change the activity of pretty much any body system in line with expected demands. So for example, at times when the animal's gonna be eating, the uh, metabolic system can be most active making us more alert, increasing uh, body temperature, those sorts of things. So there's this very important role that light plays, which is almost exclusively subconscious. And in mammals at least, that comes also from the eye. So in lots of non-mammalian vertebrates, there are photoreceptors outside of the eye which are dedicated to measuring light as a way of telling time of day. But we as mammals use only photoreceptors in our eyes for that purpose. about what sort of things might cause people to lose their vision, um, then the common diseases uh, worldwide are things like cataract, which is a cloudiness of the lens inside the eye. Um, but if we think of something in the UK and other developed countries, then uh, conditions like age-related macular degeneration are the most common causes. Um, and in the UK, uh, most patients with cataract have that operated on and treated, but macular degeneration is a bit more difficult to treat. Some people are blind because they have damage in the brain. Um, 
but it's still true that amongst the most common forms of blindness arise because people have problems with their retina, this very specialist tissue that lines the inside of the, the back of the eye and that we use for our, it's the origin of, of, of that, uh, of vision. Once people have lost sight, there are a number of options. So one thing you can do is you can use an electronic prosthesis, so try and introduce an array of stimulating electrodes to replace the photoreceptors that might be implanted in the back of the retina. And there are devices around that do that and perform and provide some visual restoration for some people. Uh, the other way you can do it is to think about a biological solution where you could take the proteins that absorb light and put those back into into the, the, the remaining cells of the, of the retina, so that then you can restore the photo, photoreception um, in, those, in those subjects in a biological way. And it's that latter approach that we're interested in exploring. If people have a visual impairment that, that can't be treated, if they have due to an eye disease that's, uh, that's not treatable, um, then what we use are different sorts of magnifying devices and those might be optical or electronic types of magnifiers. Uh, nowadays there's also great interest in the use of smartphones and different sorts of apps um, and it's thought that that could be the biggest change that's happened in the, in the life of people who are visually impaired uh, for, for many years.